Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. This is episode number 289, Dos Ocho Nuevo. How you guys are doing? Or how are you doing? Or how are you guys doing? Or how are you guys? Or how are you? Whatever that way is. I hope you're doing well. How are you? You fine? Great. Amazing. Myself? I'm feeling brilliant. Let me say brilliant. I'm going to say brilliant. I'm feeling quite brilliant. I just got back from the gym. As per usual, it's Monday morning. The first thing you do, you wake up early. You brush your teeth. Or in my case, you just splash your face with water and you count that as brushing your teeth, right? You know, back in the day when you used to like wash your armpits and count that as a shower. I'm so f- nasty. I'm such a nasty old man that I wake up in the morning. I put the water on cold. And I just splash my face with water and I decide to go to a gym. God forgive or, you know, God forgive me or God forgive you or God grant you um some kind of... um what do you call it, courage and resistance if you happen to talk to me in the gym because once I open my mouth, I'm not responsible for the fumes that come out of it. I'm not responsible for the stench that might fill the room. I'm not responsible for the tear gas that emanates from my mouth. I'm not responsible for it. It's your fault for asking me questions in the gym because you shouldn't. You shouldn't be talking to me in the gym. You should be leaving me alone but once I open my mouth without brushing my teeth and I expose you to that it's not my problem anymore. It's your problem. You shouldn't have asked me a question. You should just let me go on my weights you should just wait for me to finish and then you could have jumped on the machine or the bench press or the flipping, you know, squat rack, whatever it may be. And you could have used it on your own regard. But you went to ask me a question. You went to start talking. You went to start getting chatty. I gave you my breath and now you're making a stinky face. That didn't actually happen, but I'm just running you through, a, you know, a scenario that could happen. But yeah, I got from the gym feeling pretty good. I'm going to have a two a day today. So a little session the day before work and then another one after work, um, a run. As per usual, I mentioned to you before, part of Sober October, it's a run Monday and Friday. M- Monday and Friday, I have my double sessions because I want to start the week strong and I want to end it strong. And then I also have like a little recovery run on Saturday and then I try and rest on a Sunday. It's a pretty intense um, cycle. I found that usually, especially now with Sober October, obviously it's easier without the hangovers and stuff. But I found that with the fasting included... I usually start to feel a bit tired and a bit fatigued and a bit, you know, run down and not really wanting to go work out by about Wednesday. It's when my body starts saying to me, oh, why don't you just take a break, take a break, take a break. But then as soon as I get over the, the, the quote unquote hump day, as soon as I get over it, it's fine. It's plain sailing from then on because Thursday in my head is basically Friday, Friday is basically Saturday and I'm basically, the week has ended, right? Because by the time you get to Thursday, there's no way you're going to cheat or fuck up because you're, look, I've, I've done the weekend, I might as well do, I've done four days, I might as well do it until Friday. You get to Friday, I might as well do the Saturday and then boom, you're done, you got your cheat day and you're ready to roll out. So I'm feeling pretty good, man. As you can tell, I've got loads of energy. Um, the fasting has been working really well with the app Zero. So big up that app as well. If you haven't used it, I recommend you do check it out. Um, it's free on the app store now it's called zero it allows you to intermittent fast and track your fasting there's loads of fasting you can do circadian rhythm fasting you can do like three day or two day fasting you know 48 hour fast and all that malarkey 36 and all that da, 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 da. um yeah so check that out if you're that way inclined but yeah i'm feeling good man i'm feeling bloody good feeling fresh and ready to go so let's get podding let's get podcasting let's get talking let's start running through these topics one by one and then we'll end the show nicely and you can go about your day. Oh, yeah, as per usual, don't forget, um, if you're watching this video and you like what I'm saying or you listen to the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review. If you're watching the YouTube app, give me a thumbs up. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think about the show. It helps to get it spread and all that malarkey, you know? Nice little algorithm boost there for moi. Um, and, yeah, check me out on the socials. Links below in the show description or in the description of the podcast. You'll find the social links on there. And I'll also link on the YouTube um, video my uh, clips my clips playlist. So you can check out all the clips from the show. If you just want to see a particular segment that you want to replay again and again and again for my comedic value. <laughs> but, yeah, um, let's get in on it. Let's get in on it. So, number one. It's going to because it's fresh in my mind. I want to speak about it now. I went to Fold you last uh, Saturday night actually to go and see uh, Richie Horton play a set for uh, be- um, the tour he's doing for his um, new album that just came out, right? So it was a plus eight club tour. Um, he did a video, an amazing Apple tutorial video thing that I just checked out recently that was really good. And you know, I've been a fan of Richie Horton for a long, long time. Um, so I decided to buy a ticket last minute. I was at home. I had nothing to do really, so I was just like, you know what? I start literally stumbled upon it when I was just at home chilling. I was like, you know what? Let me just go. And, let's just go and see what it was about. So I found a ticket on Ticket Swap. Uh, thankfully, um, I'll just put the I'll just put the thing up on here on the screen, and so you guys can check it out. Let me see if I can get this to work. Blah, 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 blah. Lift it up a little bit. So yeah, um, I found a ticket on Ticket Swap for this event here. Ritual in plus eight club tour at Fold. Um, for, Ritual in playing alongside um, Matrix Man, Fabio, Florida, and on. 
on Yava, but I, I didn't see both two people. I, I got in, I think I got inside the venue by 2 a.m. I had to queue up from one o'clock basically to two, an hour queue, which is a bit nuts, but you know, it was absolutely ramming there, so I don't blame them. Sometimes when you queue for a long time and you finally get into a space and it's empty, it can just make, fill you with rage, but this time I don't blame them. They were managed to queue really well, and we got in, you know, about an hour, and it was really packed, it was full of sweat, and you know, it was a good, it was a good occasion in there. I can't be mad at it. So yeah, I went to go see him last minute. Comment. Yeah, I've been a fan of Richie from the very, very beginning, man. Like, um, he was probably my one of my first couple of DJs that I was first introduced to when I got into electronic music. Obviously, because he, he was one of the biggest stars, but more so because of his unconventional approach to DJing. You know, he really stuck with vinyl for a long time. He moved into using MIDI controllers and kind of doing all with laptops and really getting a bit. He was very. Me- I think maybe it's the it's the Detroit thing, but he has a very mechanical way of playing. Kind of reminds me a lot of like DVS One, Derek May. Um, all those dudes, right? They have a very like everything's very physical. They're very in ch- Jeff Mills, right? They, they kind of it, there's not a lot of time like spent with your hands in the air, like you know, pumping and waving and whatever, making heart symbols. They're really about like making sure that you see them. I don't know. They're really about like cr- like they, I feel as if they let they did they um they disc they deconstruct tunes. They don't just let them play out. Like I have sometimes when I mix some of my tunes, I can have a time like I don't know because I just love the I don't love the music. Because I, I have a different way of mixing. Like, I like to sometimes mix and play the whole song and then maybe loop the last couple of minutes of it. But I like to hear the both... Like, if it was a hip-hop song, for instance, if I hip-hop DJ, I would want to hear both choruses. I don't want to hear the first verse chorus and then cut off. I want to hear both choruses and then kind of loop the end of it. But um, those really high-level DJs, especially the techno ones I've just mentioned, DBS one Richie Richard Horton, have a very mechanical way where they all kind of... You won't even recognize a track because he would just probably take the percussion bit you know towards the middle and loop that for i don't know 12 bars then re- then put another uh bass underneath it and another high on top of it like three decks and you're just like what the fuck is that you do, so there's no point even sometimes shazam in their tracks because you know they're literally taking bits out of one bit and plucking around a bit it's just, it reminds me of like of a it reminds me of a fruity loops um construction of a, of a track right those little different squares everywhere you're kind of putting together and trying to make a song out of it just insanely insanely um um forward thinking and just unique way of playing music so i've been a big fan but one of the videos that really kind of piqued my interest about richard Hoy and i'm going to play for you guys here was this video that i remember seeing on youtube that really made me fall in love with djing and really gave me and it's funny because this video is like 11 years ago uploaded on, on youtube i'm not sure if it was filmed 11 years ago but it's from um i think a rooftop party in berlin and number one it exposed me to berlin right it exposed me to the whole like um um open air sort of like thing they have when it, when it's the summer everything's open air there's open air this open air that open air that like open air is essentially their version of just like an outdoor party and they're hosted literally everywhere they don't have as much they don't have as many stringent rules to do with um, noise pollution as we do in london a lot of the parties we have in london that are in parks and stuff go through a lot of approvals they have to go for a lot of checks before they get approved so essentially you're only limited to a certain couple of locations to do those open air parties and if you've been to any kind of rooftop party in london you'll know that they're um, immensely oversubscribed they're they're super in demand there's not many for, for you to go to so when you go to them they're obviously always full they're fucking ram jammer because there's not many places that you can go and have an open air party where berlin essentially any space that you can hook up a generator or you can hook up a sound system and it's got mains and you can pop a couple of speakers in that's your open air party so they go off on it so i remember seeing this video from richie horton in berlin that made me fall in love with berlin and also made me love fall in love with richie with um with djing because it was such a um a risky thing to play such a risky set to play in that venue number one it's the top it's the top of a hotel somewhere it's open air and he's playing vinyl and it happened to be a quite windy day so Imagine playing vinyl with the wind blowing and your needle skipping and he somehow managed to kind of rescue the set and play something. He somehow managed to play within those um, those constraints, right? With those kind of um, obstacles along his way, he managed to still kind of keep a cohesion set mix, a guy leaning over the front of the decks asking if he wants drugs. Like just a, just a whole plethora of nonsense, right? Dudes and girls on the left and right and them dancing too close to the turntables, making it skip. Just... Everything that you don't want as a DJ, right? The annoying guy that's offering you drugs or asking for a request. The girl at the side that's bumping your decks. And just generally the, a shitty vibe. But he still was able to kind of lock in and kind of just concentrate and be a professional and do the job. I was like, wow, that's what I want to do. I want to play music. So this is the video I'm going to play here. It's called uh, Richie Hall in that weekend, Roof, Roof, uh, Ber- Roof Berlin. And it was uploaded 11 years ago. So this is potentially the first 
well, when I first started DJing. So 11 years ago, when I first kind of got really serious with DJing, and then, um, you know, there was a few times back in the secondary school playing the old Grime and Garage track, but for the most part, when I used to put on Nights in Yellowbird, that was kind of the first couple of times that I kind of got to DJ on my own. So this is the set here I'll play for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I got drugs if you want. So. Okay, cool, man. And then here's 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 we join playing with the vinyl decks, right? Some annoying girl at the back. Probably I don't know if she's a musician or something. People leaning against the, the side. It's essentially a big rooftop, but at the top of a hotel, open air, wind blowing all over the place. But lovely. Look, some guy's got a drink, a beer in his hand, and he's waving up in the air right next to the vinyl, right next to the decks. It's a real time capture though, isn't it? He's got an American apparel hoodie on with a white finger next to the zip. But it's an amazing video, man. I'm sure we're doing this thing. Windy, it's windy. Look how long the bottles are going all over the place. Like it's such an awful, awful scenario. <laughs> but he still manages to fucking smash it. You have to rate the guy. How lucky are these people to go see the show and play on top of Ruto and Berlin somewhere like this, right? It wasn't the best word for either. People are actually put their hoods up and shit, so it's probably quite cold. But yeah, this is probably one of the only times you're going to see Richie Hutton play like a, a traditional DJ set like this, you know? Honestly. He's, he's always using controllers and MIDI controllers. Right now. Anyway, so that, that was the video that made me fall in love with DJing. I was like, you know what? I need to be a DJ. I need to be a DJ. And then, and then um, recently too, I stumbled upon this video of his um, when he was at the um, Apple event, right? Um, he was promoting his uh, Capture 8 show and kind of showing off what he's going to do during his live performances. And it's a very, very, very mechanical um, analog way of playing. He's got, on one side, he's got like a MIDI um, panel controller that he usually uses. And then on the other side, he's got this amazing board full of knobs and buttons and stuff. And he essentially goes through his whole process, how he wants it to be filmed. There's an amazing video online you can watch out, watch as well that kind of encapsulates it. But this is the video from the Apple event that he did. Thank you for coming. Uh, we're on here YouTube. today to talk about. Let me quickly a skip through it. But you can see him playing it. It kind of shows Maybe off again, how he's basically going to perform the set. See if I can find it. What, what's going to work right now? Where is it been now? Da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. Happens usually when. Where is it? So the end. Right, there you go. This is playing. So on one side he's got the laptop and the MIDI controller. Where I, I don't know if it's on one side he's that's where I should have watched it. We watched it. Remember what he said, but I think one side is where he's sort of essentially controlling the the music that's coming through. And on the other side, he's kind of manipulating what it sounds like, analogly. Fucking incredible, man. I love how you, his head bobbles as he's going along with it, like. And he's got two tables set on either side of him, so he's standing face on, but he's kind of moving back and forth, like flipping around. It's fucking cool. And then he's got the little screen that kind of films, that kind of um, projects these images onto the, the screen that's behind him. But yeah, an incredible thing. He filmed this during the, the Milan, the Apple Milan store, sorry, for the workshop. So I'll link it in the show notes, you guys check out yourselves, but I'll pause it for now. So that's the video that kind of got me peaked. I was like, oh shit, let me check it out. Then I saw the, obviously the event for Fold, and I thought, last minute, let's go. Ended up going, um, left the house around 12.30, got there about 1. It's not too far from where I live, so that was that was a fairly um, easy journey. And again, I went there sober. So sober October, going to a club like that is not probably the best experience, but... I quite enjoyed it, to be honest, because, again, I went there specifically to see Richard in play. I didn't go there to have, like, a, a night out and get fucked up. So, essentially, it was, like, a gig really late, right? It was a gig that ended at 6 a.m. Ended up getting there, and the queue is long. Like, the queue is probably snaking all the way back to around the... The queue is snaking all the way back um, around the corner of, of Fold. So, if you know where Fold is on St. Is it St. Stephen Street or wherever that street is, it kind of snaked a b- back around... Um, so I and it was it wasn't a single file queue. There was kind of like three or four people um, stacked against each other. So I was like, oh, we're gonna wait for a while. And I kind of assumed straight straight away it was gonna be like a forty five minute queue if they're gonna let because they usually bring people in by batches in terms of five because they do quite a thorough search at the front of fold. So if you're wondering to go to fold, make sure you don't bring anything naughty in there because they've got you know a real big table at the front. They have a pot where you put your stuff in, and then you got they got security that kind of go through everybody and um I can't, no, that kind of search everyone, 
and then they scan your passport or whatever be your id take a picture of you if you haven't been there before and then you can kind of go in and get your ticket stamped or get your ticket scanned sorry by the girls that usually sit on the table so in in all like you know it, it takes a couple of minutes to get through especially if they're doing it in a good way and they're making sure the club is not you know packed and stuff inside but um 45 minute wait not too bad the queue is fairly well behaved no 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 one really acting like a fool there um end up getting in just before one o'clock um and again, like I mentioned before in the beginning, when I got in there, I, 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 knew, I knew it was four because number one, tickets sold out a few days ago. Number two, I got my ticket on a resale site, Ticket Swap. So check that out. A really great site, ticketswap.co.uk. One of my favorite sites to go in and get tickets because you don't have to deal with the people individually. People list their, their tickets on there. They upload them. The tickets get authenticated. And then once you buy them, they get immediately sent to your email address. So like, you don't have to wait with somebody. Sometimes you buy them on, fa on Facebook. You monitor some of the money. You don't know if they're going to send you a ticket or just run away. So, you know, it's not worth the, it's not worth the hassle doing it. So I'd rather do it on ticketswap.co.uk. Went in. Got my um, got my uh, locker thing because you do lockers in in fold, so it's ten pound deposit, or it's a or a five pound if you don't have your own locker. So if you bring your own locker, then you're fine. But if you don't have your own, they'll give you a locker and it's a ten pound deposit. You'll get back at the end of the night. So I went in there, got my got my um, uh, rented the thing for five for a fiver, paid for that for a fiver essentially, um, and then got my bag, put it in the locker. And essentially made it to made my way for to a dance floor. I had a couple of Red Bulls before I got there, so I was, you know, I was on good form. And then I think I basically saw Matrix Man playing from two to three, no two to four, and then Richard Owen played from four to six. Matrix Man was pretty solid. I think a couple of people mentioned in the beginning. Um, I'll put that shit event here. Some some guy I, I bumped into the toilet was like, oh, he wasn't really a fan of Matrix Man in the beginning. I think the first hour was a bit slow, but I think he, as all good DJs are at that elite level, he kind of recognized that the, the flow wasn't there and he just, you know, came with it and started playing a bit harder. Um, and again, it's proper difficult, I think, because essentially, even though it was, it was, uh, it was late, it was a effectively a warm-up set for Richie. So I'm assuming he was very conscious about not, you know, not going too hard. But by the time Richie came on, he really prepped everyone really well. Richie just came on and didn't even warm up, just went straight. That's that. That's what I realized about the elite DJs in that regard. Like, he just went straight in. He didn't even bother having, like, you know, sometimes people play white noise to kind of, you know, um, um, cleanse a palate, as per se, um, create a bit of space from the, first, the last DJ. Um, Major Man played his last song, and Richie just went, boom, 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 boom. He didn't even <laughs> start, he didn't start soft. He just went straight for the juggler, and it was fucking awesome. Um, it was cool because it was it was filmed the same way you'd see it in the video that they play. Um, oh, the video that actually the, the, there's actually a video here. Let me see if I can find it from the Milan show that he pre premiered. That kind of mixes together all the appearances from Milan, Paris, and somewhere else. So it kind of shows what it is, but. You don't see it like the video. You don't really see him on the screen because um, Ford hasn't got that capability. But they do really good light shot at the back of him that was like making it look like a shadow and stuff. It was fucking spooky shit. But um, it worked really well. You couldn't really see him on the stage. It was really blacked out and dark. That's what I quite like about um, Ford in general. They don't really shine a light on the DJ so you can just stare at him. It's all about dancing. Everyone's really having a good time and really going crazy. Even the people at the VIP bit, the, the bit, because on the side, on the right hand side, to the stage's left or to your right hand side, if you're facing the DJ, there's like a bit where all the people that have VIP pass can go in, go around the back, and you know, and um, and kind of you know, um, what you call it, air kiss each other and stuff, and hang out and be cool. But even those people, because sometimes I've been there, and you know, it's kind of the the, the 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 up your nose sort of like a bit, you know, up your nose kind of people. But for the most part, they were going crazy too. Rich Holland really brought the party people out. VIP were dancing, the club kids were dancing, all the weirdos were dancing. I was dancing. Like there was a few older people there too, which was, speaks to his and um, Paul. I saw a lot of kind of older kind of electronic music heads that were there just to kind of see him play. A very very diverse crowd. Again, that's why I'm, I'm I've, I've kind of maintained. I think Fold might be the best London club out. You know. Like I've got, I haven't been to a few of the other clubs in the UK, so I'm not gonna go out that far and say it's the best club in the UK. But I think it might be the best London club that we have at the moment, it, like easily. Um, from the organisation, from the security to the efficiency of the bar, there was like I don't know four people working behind a bar plus a bar back, right? And they were like quick running through the drinks. Fair enough, it's easier to fold, especially at, at that main bar because they don't have a. Did they have a tap? Did they don't use a tap? I don't know. I thought some people, more people were ordering cans uh, of beer, right? I'm not sure if they have a if they have a, a tap at, the, at that bar. I'm not too sure, but regardless, four people plus a bar back, they were really efficient. They just smashed through the stuff. There was another girl that was doing giving people the lockers and the padlocks. They were a really good team, really efficient way to go about things. Just in general, nice vibe. Um, so this is kind of the, the performance, what it looks like, right? It's a video that he kind of um, promoted in Milan show, and it kind of shows you essentially what it essentially what it looks like. So let me know the sound. Here so you don't get there. 
But so yeah, he's he's got two machines or two units either side of him. You can't really see him when he's playing. It's sort of completely dark, blacked out. But he did a really really good way of kind of displaying the kind of visual, the light and visual of him performance at the back of behind the screen. That was really cool to see. But yeah, he smashed it. Absolutely smashed it. Man. I can't be mad at it at all. So that was sort of like what you see when you when you perform it. Again, I linked the video in the show notes. But it was a really good performance. Um, smashed it. Really great way of kind of like going through the ebbs and flows. I danced my ass off the entire time. The only thing I'd say for them to improve at fold would be the air conditioning. Like for people, like I don't know how, like for them not to have air conditioning on the main dance floor is just insane. It was so fucking hot. Like it was, I was melting. I, I completely sweated through my shirt. Like it was just insane how warm it was, man. Just too, too, too warm. Um, they don't have any air conditioning in there. The, we went to I went to the smoking area for a bit. And I was talking to some guys in the smoking area, and they had this big fan that's facing the outside, which is weird. Everyone's like, "Why they got a fucking fan outside?" So that's anything that's a bit of a concern there. There's not much air conditioning. It's really really warm, um, and it just gets too ungodly warm. There's a girl next to me that was you know a bit you know a bit light headed. Another dude who can probably just drunk too much was a bit wasted on the floor. But in general, it's just too it's just too warm too warm in there. They need air conditioning. Um, but again, as I said, apart from that. For the venue, lineup, the price you pay, the time it stays open, best London club out, hands down. I fucking love Fold, man. So yeah, uh, Ritual was fucking awesome. Great to see a, that kind of level of DJ play. Again, my, one of the years that I kind of fell in love with from the beginning that kind of got me into electronic music and he kind of delivered, man. He delivered and showed exactly why he's at the apex of this thing that we call electronic music and just kind of doing his own thing, in it? Like he just, you know, he's always trying to introduce new new equipment, new gadgets to kind of make his life as a DJ more interesting and it's cool to see that he's still kind of bringing it um, even at, at this stage of his career where he probably should be sitting on the beach somewhere sipping on uh, sangrinis. He's out here, you know what I mean, pushing the envelope, playing... I don't even know if that's if that might be the smallest venue he's played at, you know, Richard Hoyne. He plays at all the biggest clubs. So imagine that was a pretty that was a pretty good experience. Very, very lucky to go there, if you're thinking about it. See Rich Hoyne in a venue like Fold. I don't know what the, what is the capacity for Fold? Is it five hundred people? Let me see if I can see it on Resonant Advisor here. What's the capacity of Fold? It is yeah, five hundred people. Five hundred people capacity venue. And we saw Richie Horton. I'm not mad at that whatsoever. So yeah, great night, had a good time. Absolutely awesome. Again, recommend you check out Fold. One of my favorite clubs in London, hands down. Like I said before, I went to the first party and I had a blast. I went to a few others there and I had a blast. Like it's one of my favorite venues. I've probably been there more of. I've probably been to that club more in this year, like consecutively than any other place in London. Probably the only thing coming second to it will be XOY, right? Um, and a few people don't really have don't really have good things to say about it, but I quite I quite like it. I think as for a big kind of commercial club in that respect um i think it's really really good they do a really good way they do a really good um their program is really good as well like especially with the pleasure hood stuff they've got now at the moment the long residency they have with djs um i really like how they kind of work things out you know it gets a bit too full there it's probably a bit too much security but again it's in shoreditch it's, it's a home of the you know the everyday folk average joe so they probably have to be a little bit more careful who they let in there but by and large w- really good but Definitely Fold is number one in that position. I really recommend you check it out. One of my favorite venues out there. Go to Fold. You will not regret it. Okay, next on the list. We have here. Oh, talking about DJing. I have, to, I have to declare an apology. I have to be, I have to be apologetic today. Today's Agostino Sorry Day. Agostino apologize, right? And it's something I have to apologize for, but something that I'm not necessarily known for. It's not something that I usually do. I usually got some staunch defense against sort of stuff, but you know. You're going to another country, you're feeling a little bit excited, you're feeling a little bit giggly, you're feeling a little bit giddy, sorry, and you want to just, you know, enhance your experience, and sometimes you get in your own head, you sometimes get worried that you won't get into a place, and you're like, oh my god, it's going to fuck up, but you know, by and large, when you go on your own, you always get in, so I'm just worried, right, so, well, you guys know I went to Berlin a few weeks ago, went to Bergen Pacific to go see some DJs play, and before I went out there, I realised when I looked at the lineup, I was like, oh shit, Crystal Clear's playing, I was like, oh shit, Crystal Clear, I know that guy. I DJed with him once once before. DJed with him, I wouldn't say that. He, I was DJing in a place that he happened to be DJing after, right? After me, after I played a set. It was like a, some like Shoreditch store opening thing. Um, and Crystal Clear played after me. Um, really cool. He kind of complimented my tracks and was just generally a good dude. And, you know, I exchanged messages with him a couple of times after after the fact. Once, I think, to book him for a party I was going to do. And then another, just, you know, just in general, just being, you know, a friendly DJ pal. You know, they weren't really friends, but in my head we are. So, um, yeah, I was going to Berlin. I saw he was on the burger. And I was like, oh, let me reach out to this guy because obviously he's my friend. Not really. And see if I can get on the guest list. 
I messaged him and, you know, of course, got complete air on road, which is, you know, n- not too dissimilar from what I was expecting. So, you know, I, I kind of had the adage of you'd never know until you ask. So I never really thought much of it. And I just continued my life, went to Berlin, got in pretty easily and everything went well. So I'm play. I was like, yeah, it was amazing. Great. Don't hold any grudges because, again, he doesn't owe me an explanation. He's not my friend. doesn't owe me a uh, response. on my friend. No problem. But then I saw this thread from uh, another DJ in the scene called DJ Non-Compliant. Or Non-Compliant, sorry, that you guys will be familiar with. And she said something that really made me feel a bit yucky for sending in the message. And I'm going to read out the thread, right? And I kind of uh, read a kind of a response on there that you can see for your own eyes. So Non-Compliant made this tweet um, the other day. After she kind of announced that she was going to DJ at the Burger Iron 2, right? And you can see my name at the bottom there. So you're going to see what I'm going to say. She said the following tweet, right? She said, Dear random strangers asking for guests to Berlin. At Bergheim, sorry. Do you just assume none of our DJs, or none of DJs have friends? <laughs> and I saw the tweet. I was like, oh, shit. It made me immediately remember the message I sent to Crystal Clear. Message you just sent to him. And I was like, oh, man. That was probably a bad move, innit? But in the time, in a moment, I didn't think of it as a bad thing. I just kind of assumed. I've spoken to this guy before. I don't know why in my head I thought it was, a, it was cool. Obviously, it wasn't. But I just assumed in my head it would be fine. So I sent a message. But then in my head also, I didn't expect a response if it was a no, right? I kind of had that I have kind of had that thing in my memory of when Kanye West said in the interview, if I don't say yes, it means no. So when you, when I, when you send or you, when you request something from somebody that has more status or influence than you, they don't, they, you, I usually ex- expect, I usually assume that they probably have a lot of requests coming at them. So it's their prerog- it's within their prerogative, you know, um, it's their right to choose who they respond to and don't respond to. I don't take it personally because, you know, you are reaching out to the person with higher status or higher pull or with the thing that you need. It's up to them to decide whether or not they want to reply or not. So I didn't really think much of it. If he doesn't reply, he doesn't reply. So she said that. And then my tweet after, well, there was, as a response, was the following. I said, the common adage is, you don't know if you don't ask. Laugh emoji. And I guess there's nothing wrong with strangers asking in in, respe- in, a, in a respectable manner and you, an artist, um, ignoring a request or politely declining. Unless you're getting 50 plus requests each day, each time you play, then they can fuck off. Yeah? And compliance with the following. Ask anyone who's ever played. The flood of requests from strangers starts about a week before and continues well past the time after just have to turn in their guest list. It's fully obnoxious. And then I said, <laughs> which again, it's completely true. There's nothing there that's not true. Because I think I sent it a couple of weeks beforehand. So obviously I was cognitive enough or awareness think you know what, let me get in beforehand but it's like imagine asking a dj especially somebody that crystal clear state is over non-compliant or those other djs and asking them to get you on a guest list assuming that that dj hasn't had their own friends request those same spots when they announce it it's it's similar to like you know i'm sure as a dj when you were coming up or when you're playing open decks or when you were just you know playing in fucking shitholes you probably couldn't get, you probably couldn't pay your friends to come and see you play in some of the clubs you played at. But the moment you reach a certain point where you start playing the festivals that all your friends go to anyway, the clubs that they all attend to anyway, then suddenly the requests start piling in because you now suddenly have reached a stage that everyone kind of needs something from you. So I, I'm, I'm fully aware that that was a real error on my part. But again, I didn't really see it from that point of view because you're just looking at it from like, you want something, right? And that probably happens a lot of people ask for favors. You don't necessarily see it from the uh, point of view from the person you're asking from. You just see, you know, that's my friend. I need some money. They should be able to give it to me. But you don't see it from their end where it's like, if you're asking them for money, that must mean everyone else is aware that they also have a lot of money. So they're potentially being pulled in all different directions from their family to their siblings, not from their parents, to their siblings, to colleagues at work, to close friends they grew up with. Everyone's pulling at them. So for me asking a request and then getting upset and not responding is as compliant non-compliant said very very obnoxious and then i said in response i kind of conceded and was like okay fair enough i didn't know it was um that bad of an issue sounds incredibly annoying and like other guys have said very presumptuous on their part hopefully you, your tweet will go a long way to addressing the issue in some way i fully had my tail between my legs got embarrassed just kind of you know ran for the hills and you know the fray goes on everyone's side kind of um um uh, i started giving them to all them instead of friends that don't show up uh, yeah exactly so and then that's what i said and then at the bottom here this dude here love fingers who is another uh, very popular producer and dj said the following which was quite a good point 
It says, I started giving it to all of the people that asked me instead of my friends who don't show up, which is, just, again, imagine the front, imagine the fucking front of a dude or a girl, or whoever it may be, or a gaggle of friends to ask their friend who's playing at the burger and really an important set, a DJ set that if I had to play, I would be having nightmares about it for, you know, two, three weeks on edge. I'd be planning my tunes to the fucking core. I'd be fucking so scared of making a mistake when I go, right? So you're worried about playing the set and your friends kind of, you know, expound that worry by requesting you DJ, by requesting guest spots, which is nerve wracking to say at least because now your friends are going to come see you. It's, fair, it's, bad, it's bad enough clanging and having a shit set in front of strangers, but imagine doing it in front of people you don't know. No, imagine doing it in front of people that you do know, right? So it's a complete fuck show. So imagine doing it with your friends and then not turning up to the gig. That's fully piss, like a piss take. So this guy, um, Lovefinger, says now he's what he does is give them to people that request them instead of the people that don't turn up, which is another way to do it. But I think in general, this kind of goes out to everyone. Like Again, as I repeat, this is my formal apology to Crystal Clear. I, I apologize for, you know, being presumptuous and thinking you don't have any friends, even though he used to fucking live in Berlin himself. So obviously he's going to have people kind of reaching out and wanting to have guest spots. My bad. So I apologize for that. But also, this is a formal announcement and awareness to everybody out there. If you have DJ friends, or if you have people that, or if you have people that you want to reach out to to get guest lists for really hard to go to spots or DJ um, gigs, don't. Only do it if you've been supporting he or she from the very beginning. If you were, if you went to go see, let me, I don't know why I mentioned a lot, but if you went to go see fucking a Claire Fifi play at some shitty pub somewhere in East London, right, and you were the first person to buy her tunes or something like that right and she's seen you with her at some shitty place in the pub and she remembers your face and stuff and you have some cordial hires and buyers and you exchange hugs and shit and maybe she's offered you a guest list spot some other times and you've kind of maybe um you know then uh, taken her up on an offer here and then and she plays at burger and you're like hey reaching out to her maybe then because there's something there there has there's a there's a link between you guys. There are some commonality there. And there's also the idea that you've kind of supported her from the very beginning, right? She might feel obliged to kind of give you a spot because you're actually a supporter. You're not even a friend that just has to support because you're a friend. You're a stranger who happens to be following her career and she's appreciative of the support. But if it's just a regular person, if it's just a regular DJ who you have no affinity with, apart from you liking their DJ sets on Boiler Room or apart from you just being a fan from the outside, don't message them. Leave them alone. They've got enough to worry about as it is. They're playing at Berghain. It's essentially the comedy store. It's com essentially the comedy store in LA for DJs, right? It's the pinnacle. It's the mecca. It's the place where all the best people play. You want to play. It's one of the rare places, like probably like the comedy store, where you want to do well in front of your peers. You don't want to fuck up in front of your peers. You don't want all your fellow DJ friends to think you're shit, right? And it's also the place where all the discerning real fans of electronic music come. Straight up, there's some tourists, but everyone there knows everyone there follows producers they buy vinyl they buy tunes even if they don't dj they buy people's merch they're really obsessive about the culture that's why you'd go and trek all that way to berlin in the middle of the winter you go and queue outside to get rejected by this dude tattooed all over his face with piercings coming all over the place that's why you do that because you love the music so you don't want to fuck up in that kind of venue so for people for strangers to come out and add added pressure to you by flooding your inbox with requests for a gig that you're going to play when they didn't have any care about you prior because you know they didn't care about you and now they saw you in a line that they want to reach out no don't do it don't do it it's it's really bad etiquette and now i think i've sort of learned my lesson going forward and it's not a lesson really because it's i think essentially the first time i've ever done this right email someone i don't know about fucking guest list but yeah in future i'd say don't do it just don't do it in general if you're going to get a guest list spot just finesse it in your own way right um asking somebody to get you on something is never a good way to do it i think it just immediately puts the power and the or not power it puts the sense of ownership onus on the other person and they have to feel like they're kind of doing you a favor or doing a job for you which is never a good dynamic you want you want to be able to put yourself in a position where someone just has to maybe approve you right but not you placing all the thing the authority on their hands like yes Please help me out with this thing because it creates a weird power imbalance. Even with somebody that's not a jackass, they can end up pretending to a jerk. You don't want to do it. Just allow it. So yeah, formal apology to Crystal Clear. I'm sorry. But also, Love Fingers, if you want to go ahead and sit on there, guess this on Love Fingers. He's giving them out like fucking Maltesers, isn't it? So if you want one, go to Love Fingers. Actually, don't. Don't do that. He's probably just talking in jest. But yeah, um, that was my formal apology to um, Crystal Clear. Now we can move on. I feel conscious is clear now. Ah, pun intended. Um, so, so let's move on. Let's move on in. Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt. Blah, blah, blah. There's. A, I. I saw this uh, article the other day on High Society detailing uh, Brad Pitt's um, workout for Fight Club, right? 
and I'm sure you guys are aware of Fight Club, awesome movie. Um, I think it's celebrating his 20th anniversary and they um, were able to kind of break down his essentially his workout regimen for it. And it's not dissimilar from what I expected. It's a lot of um, low, um, low weight, high rep workouts and loads of cardio to achieve the body and obviously most of the diet probably number one but you know making sure you're doing loads of repetitions or really you know low weight to really stress the muscles really get the definition in there and then running your ass off to get that really slim physique and i know when it first came out people were obsessed with that figure right they wanted that kind of the v that kind of shape it was the kind of apex for all um i don't know guys that are working out in the gym and i loved it i love i love that physicality but i think it was interesting because you look at what he looks like in there right and then you search for brad pitt uh topless in once upon a time right and he's putting a considerable amount of muscle between then and obviously it's 20 year gap in between it but he's putting a lot of muscle between those two films and you see him what he looks like in once upon a time in hollywood and he is fucking j -j -j jacked he's massive Maybe because they, they made him wear tighter clothes and the shirt he's wearing in most of the time in Hollywood is really tight, but he looks really big. Really, really big, man. He looks incredible, incredible, incredible shape. Um, so, yeah, um, I don't know. I, I, I assume it's, it's a different way of doing the, the weights. Probably probably higher weights, lower reps in terms of what he did for Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. But, yeah, I, I love it, man. He looks incredible there. Incredible, incredible, incredible. It was a bit weird him doing it in the movie. He just takes off his shirt and he's working on top of the roof but randomly. But, you know, they probably had to do that. It's Brad Pitt. But, yeah, loads of interesting workouts here for nothing. But I'll just run through some of them. Um, what he basically did. So, this is an article from High Snobiety. He says, when Fight Club hit the big screen uh, 20 years ago this week in 1999, people weren't just blown away by the big screen adaptation of one Chuck Palahniuk's most renowned works, a story of Ty Durden and the unnamed narrator. They were amazed by Brad Pitt's incredible body. Oh, yeah. Check out uh, Chuck uh, Palahniuk's um, YouTube. Sorry. Joe Rogan appearances. He's got some really good interview he did on there that was amazing. He kind of took through the process of writing his book the struggle of writer's block and just generally he's an incredible person to go kind of dig into his mind and see kind of where he has to go to to kind of make these stories it's really really informative really recommend you check it out the article continues say whatever you want about the film's plot or the acting or the cinematography or anything you want really but there's no denying that pat that that Pitt brought his A-game with him onto the set. In fact, his physique for five for the film was so rock solid that he's still a topic of conversation on bodybuilding and nutrition forums, internet blogs, and even high snobiety articles nearly 20 years after. But what was the secret of Brad Pitt's thing? Two cans of Newport's Day, a Coke habit. Truthfully, it wasn't magic. It was hard work, determination, and whatever. So what he was basically done, high reps and low weight, one muscle group per day, right? So your standard bodybuilding routine. Um, for Pitt's role, Tyler Durden, he was focused not much on being big meathead as he was on being shredded and punchy. Edel Norton's character was a smaller guy, and since Durden was supposed to be more aggressive and badass version of him, it meant to keep him small, hence creating the ultimate Brad Pitt Fight Club workout plan. As weightlifters and bodybuilders will tell you, there is a real easy way to sum up weight training. If you want to get big, lift heavier weight, with fewer reps if you want to lean out tone up put as less weight with more reps there's a lot more to the brad pitt fire lit, uh, fitness flex than there is but the rundown is the following pitt also focused on one muscle group per day mondays were chest day tuesdays were all about back wednesdays were shoulders thursday was arms and biceps and the rest of the week was dedicated to cardio and um and resting look but yeah here's the workout so on monday he did chest he did push-ups bench press uh natalis press incline and pec deck so really really going for it like again all sets of 25 for the most part um, and some 15s and tuesday back he did 25 pull-ups which i'm still struggling with to this day pull-ups just insanely hard to do i've been doing really well with the ring dips and the um, all the dips in general we'd have the we have that little thing it's still like a u-shape at the gym where you kind of clip it onto this unit um and you sort of essentially put it higher up or down as you want and you essentially hold on to that ring dips and then I do the dips and that's been pretty good in terms of getting my upper body strength where it should be. But again, pull ups I'm still finding really difficult. Um, he did seated rows. I've done some time. Lat pull downs. I haven't really used the machine for that. And he did T-bar rows. I haven't done it all. Wednesday's shoulders, Arnold press, laterals and front press and front raises, which I'm, I'm a big fan of. Uh, preacher curls I love. Easy curls with the, with the cable. Hammer curls on, and push up and push downs for biceps and triceps and then friday cardio treadmill so one hour of 90 minutes okay shit cardio 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 so a lot a lot of and then of course the diet let's mention we're sitting the diet here this up it tends to be confusing for people because every now and again some big ass weightlifter will post a video of their daily caloric intake 
and brag about how they have had to consume like 10,000 calories per day or some crazy shit like that. But it's important to remember that those people who have entirely different goals for their bodies than Brad Pitt do. To keep the kind of washboard abs you could ri- rise your, rinse your laundry or the Brad Pitt Fight Club diet requires ex- eating extremely clean. That means consuming a diet mainly of chicken, fish, brown rice, pasta, green veggies and oatmeal. Eating is clean, easy way and it involves general serving meals throughout the day in heavy rotation. So yeah, loads of, loads of, and this is a big, uh, big massive salad bowl. There's couscous there, mushrooms, chicken, courgettes, red onion, tomato. So everything is packed full of nutrients. You've got healthy fats, good proteins, clean carbs, just all about the, um, all about the health there. So this is a, what's the Instagram called? Healthy food advice, which is quite a cool little bowl there. So loads of really good stuff. Again, so this is the the breakfast he had. This is the the kind of wheat plan he had for the for the workout. Breakfast he had eggs, six whites, seven oaks, seven seventy five grams of oatmeal with raisins. Occasionally, bread will replace eggs with protein shake. Mid morning snack a tin tuna and whole wheat pasta breads. A pita bread, sorry. Lunch he had two chicken breasts. Um, hundred mil- seventy five to hundred milligrams, uh, sorry, of brown rice or pasta and green veggies. I think now that people just say if you're gonna eat rice and pasta, just eat the white rice. Um, just eat the white versions. I think brown has too much sugar or starch. And I forgot what that was, one of them. But people have realized that brown rice or brown pasta isn't that healthy as they make it out to be. If you're going to eat it, just eat the white version. Um, I don't tend to like to eat pasta too much or rice. I'm not really that guy, which is really strange and bizarre for some people. But I didn't really grow up eating it too much. So it's not really something I'm really fond of. Um, green veggies, mid-morning snack, pre-workout was a protein bar or whey protein protein shake and a banana. Post-workout was whey protein shake and a banana dinner, grilled fish, chicken. So, yeah, just fairly simple, extremely clean. Um, and, again, if you introduce some intermittent fasting to this, you're going to get shredded. So, yeah, really concise workout plan there, regimen. It's um it's detailed in Heist by IT. I'll link the show into it, show notes for you guys to check out. But, yeah, uh, one muscle group per day, clean eating, loads of cardio, and you can also achieve a body like Brad Pitt. Not the acting chops or whatever, but you know you can achieve the body. So yeah, check out, check it out. It's called Fight Club at Twenty, the Brad Pitt workout that will get you ripped for a revolution. Um, some high stuff by it, but again, you can check out the show notes. I'll put a link in there for you guys to so read it yourself. Next on the list here we have, ooh, talking about work, working out or talking about lack of working out. This is the old video and old topic, but I just want to go over it because I, you know, I missed some issues beforehand. But I'm really, I'm not a big fan of James Corden. I dislike him a lot. Um, and I guess I dislike him more so. This is a very controversial opinion, so hold on, hold on to your seat. I despise him because number one, I don't think he's that funny. Number two, I think he's um a bit of a people pleaser. You know that kind of you know person that's probably never going to say anything untowards because he wants to make sure he keeps his gaggle of celebrity friends. But also, it's the whole like lovable fat chubby guy thing. I hate. I'm not a big fan of. Um, and I guess this comes specifically from me being the fat, lovable, chubby guy when I was younger. And I know what your, I know what that meant. I know what your, I know what that kind of way of thinking is about, where you don't want anyone to take the piss out of how fat you are. So you, oh, you immediately overcompensate by being really funny or friendly, or you go the other way and you're a complete jerk, right? You, I know people, have, you probably met someone like that who, you know, is very, very kind of abrasive and rude from the offset, even if you haven't said nothing. It's usually because there's something about themselves. They don't, there's something about themselves that they don't want you to notice and to kind of point out. So they just go on the, on the offense straight away and kind of attack you, right? It's a very, very, very um, um, odd way to go about things, but I can, under, I can understand it, right? You don't, wanna, you don't want somebody to kind of catch you out in that regard. So you kind of go on the offense straight away. But with the James Corden thing, I know exactly what he's doing. I know what it is to be that lovable, um, happy-go-lucky, fat dude that everyone's a friend with, and I just despise it. So when I saw Bill Maher make a video about uh, fat shaming and why he thinks it's, it's still something that should be going on nowadays in order to kind of get people back into fitness, he kind of went, you know, a bit over the top. He kind of took like a, a Bill Burr approach at things, took the most um, simple of an argument and just kind of went complete the counter and just basically extrapolated it and made you really think twice about the issue. So a very Bill Burr approach to things, but, you know, I didn't think much of it. So the video kind of kept it moving. But then, of course, James Corden comes out like a baby that he is and starts crying and moaning about it. Starts talking about how uh, bad fat shaming is for people. And the video is I've got here. I'm going to play a bit of it now for you guys to check out. But there were some points in it where I just wanted to bath all over myself, right, of how he was going on about it. So this is Bill. This is Bill Maher's bit about fat shaming that I'll play for you just a little bit, which I, you know, I play. I think you guys have probably heard or seen it before. This is a video. Of it. Finally, new rule at next Thursday's debate. One of the candidates has to say. 
The problem with our health care system is Americans eat shit and too much of it. Which is not, which is not, All which the, is not that you know, crazy of a point to make, right? Americans eat like shit. Cool, no worries. Candidates will talk about their health plans, but no one will mention the key factor. The citizens don't lift a finger to help. Mm -hmm. And then the candidates will go back on the trail the next day and try to prove they're just as big a gluttonous slob as the rest of us. <laughs> Sometimes while discussing pre-existing conditions. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, true. There's a video here of, um, what's his name? Um, oh, doesn't matter, let's just continue. But why do people have so many pre-existing conditions? Being fat isn't a birth defect. Nobody comes out of the womb needing to buy two seats on the airplane. <laughs> here it is in a nutshell. Which is the point that someone would probably argue with you, right? I guess the fat acceptance people would probably say there are some genetic, gene, gene, genetic dif uh, deficiencies or abnormalities that lead people that make people more susceptible to being overweight or for gaining more weight or for being obese in general right at an early age um, there's loads of videos you see of like little of, of especially whenever i see someone that's in the fact acceptance movement they always post a picture of themselves when they're younger and they do look considerably bigger than everyone else they're hanging out with in a picture if they're like 10 or 12 you're like oh wow this kid's obviously clearly overweight there is that baby weight you kind of put on but there's a point where it starts to be like you're the only person that's kind of putting on that much weight and it can be quite upsetting if you're that age. I can assume, like, if you're 10 and 12 and you're eating the same, eating exactly the same as everyone else around you, but you put on more weight, it can be quite annoying to, like, suddenly in your head start realizing, what the fuck is going on? I mean, exactly what she's eating. Why is she skinny and why am I fat? But there has to come a point in time of personal accountability and responsibility where you're like, you know what? My body's different. Like, even myself, I know that I respond to carbs really strongly or really well, right? So if I eat a lot of carbs, I gain weight instantly. Same if I work out, if I, if I do back squats or some or something along those kind of lines my legs explode right i they become muscular straight away because i, I don't know i guess i have the profile the body shape or the comp composition that puts on a lot of muscle on my thighs on my legs or whatever it may be called so um or not whatever it may be called they, that is what they're called but yeah I, so you have to kind of make adjustments to your training program where i'm not overly um stressing my body with you know those kind of workouts so i don't get stupid big in that regard especially if i want to wear skinny jeans or designer clothing so there are things, there are kind of adjustments you have to make when you're a bigger person. It's what it is. You can't expect to just be the same as everyone else because you might be, you know, genetically predisposed to put on weight more so than other people. This is what it is, right? Let's continue. From the New York Times. Poor diet is the leading cause of mortality in the United States. Mm. Which is sad, really, considering we're living in a quote-unquote, you know, western world right civilized society that people are essentially putting their life at risk just because of what they're putting into their mouth not because of anything else not because of pollution right not because of you know inherent common chemicals in their food because of what they're eating they're essentially putting their life at risk because of the levels of sugar carbohydrates um sodium whatever it may be called right cholesterol everything that's in their body is essentially killing them bit by bit but it's probably the most sensitive and most hard topic to kind of bro broach with people. I know when I was fat, no one could kind of talk me out of buying something I wanted to eat. You couldn't talk me out of it. I'd go to a shop, I'd buy a six pack of Mars bars, I'd buy some donuts, I'd buy this, I'd buy that. And I was just a stat. I remember I mentioned to someone the other day, I remember when I used to go to lunch, right? And I used to always wonder why whenever I left the shop, yeah, this is a mark of a fat person. Whenever I left the shop, this is back in the day with, soup, with the plastic bags too, so it's a bit different of an era. But I remember whenever I left the shop getting something to eat for lunch or when I went to go get like a Tesco meal deal, I'd always kind of be self-conscious and aware that why am I the only, why am I one of one of three or four people that's leaving with a bag? I'd always have a plastic bag. And the reason why I knew I was fat and had a plastic bag because that essentially meant that I had more than three items in my bag. Because when you go and get a meal deal, it's usually like a drink, a pack of crisps and a, and a sandwich, right? They're not essentially the most healthy things in the world to eat when you're at lunch. But, you know, it's a fairly innocuous lunch, right? A sandwich, a crisp and a drink is what it is, right? If you're, if you're disciplined and you work out enough, you can maybe offset some of the um, um, negative effects of it. But in general, it's a pretty bog standard lunch. But that wasn't enough for me when I was fat. I'd have to add another thing on top of it. Maybe some chocolates, maybe a donut, maybe a pack of cookies. There was always some other thing chucked in it. And that's what essentially what required me to have a plastic bag. Because if you're essentially getting a pack of crisps and a drink and a sandwich, you just hold that shit in your hand, right? And as you're walking, eat it or grab a, or 
go to a bench somewhere and sit down and have it. But you don't need a plastic bag to hold it. And I was like, oh, those are the little things I remember about being fat. Like those kind of little triggers in my head. I'm like, shit. So now when I go to shops and I want to, you know, I have a fucking strict list of stuff that I'm buying and I don't deviate from it at all. Everyone knows obesity is linked to terrible conditions like diabetes, heart disease, and virginity. <laughs> <laughs> Which is again upset. Again, not not not. It's a it's a it's mean, but it's true. When I was fat, my hit rate with girls was low. I, I was still the same lovable, funny dude that I am now. I still probably was a lot funnier than some of the dudes that these girls were messing with, and had probably a lot more personality, a lot more charisma and more going for myself in that regard. But in terms of pure looks, in terms of pure um, attractiveness to the opposite sex, I look like I was going to die, right? If, if you say women are not only attracted to, physic, to um, physical attractiveness, they're also attracted to the fact that, you know how guys have a predisposition to be attracted to maybe girls with bigger boobs or bigger hips because, you know, there are forms of child reading, right? You assume in your head that she has big tits and she's got massive amounts of milk in them. You assume that she has massive hips that she can, you know, take care of a baby. I don't know. There's certain things in your head that have that, that have that, um, that make you react that way. So why not with guys or somebody up in the sex that you're trying to be interested or somebody that you're interested in regardless, why wouldn't it be the same if they're overweight? Why wouldn't you, why, why shouldn't girls think, oh, that guy's overweight and he's looks horrible, right? His skin is always, I remember always having spots and shit and just being fucking horrible looking. Why shouldn't they assume that you're probably going to die before you're 40, right? You won't be able to uh, be a protector or be a provider in the, con in the conventional sense for your, for your partner. It's fair to assume that. So it's no surprise that I was suffering, absolutely suffering, like with the girls. And then th the moment I lost weight, it's the moment suddenly then I, 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 I know it's also that there, are, there were some girls that were obviously interested in me during that time or that took an interest to me or that displayed forms of affection or attraction to me. Fair enough, I get it. But they were a particular set of girls who were into that but by and large i say i had a better options when i was skinny than when i was fat i had more of a like i i was open to i was available or i sensed a greater hmm, with people that were ab around you know like generally general population i think overall but let's continue with it. Oh, that's really cool. Not to it's all mean cancer. but it's true but that's just the beginning of it. There is literally nothing being overweight does not make worse. Eyesight, memory, pain, fatigue, depression. You don't poop right. <laughs> True. It weakens your immune system. We scream at Congress to find a way to pay for our medical bills, but it wouldn't be nearly the issue it is if people just didn't eat like assholes. <laughs> who are killing not only themselves, but the planet. The Amazon fires are because farmers there are burning down the rainforest to make room for future hamburgers and soybeans. Because here in America, we look at fried chicken and think, that's a good start. <laughs> put on a bun and add bacon and cheese and something no one even thought to put on it. Make my mouth come. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you you get the drift, right? He's a, but let's get the fashion in there. <laughs> What's Elizabeth Warren's plan for that? Europe doesn't look like this because Europe's not always eating for two. We weren't always like this. Watching the footage of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, I was struck by how not fat everyone in the crowd was. Uh. We look like a completely different race of people. Now look at us. We wear shirts that our ancestors could have used as a sail. A <laughs> hundred years ago, this guy was fat enough to be the fat man in the circus. Now, he's a guy. So essentially he's saying we need to bring back fat shaming, right? This is the central gist of his video. And of course, James Corden, being a fat dude himself, took offense to it and started whining and crying about the whole issue. That, you know, again, it just goes to show just how, um, I don't know, man. It's just, oh, that, that person, that kind of whiny 
girly kind of personality. I'm just not a fan of. So, so, uh, let me see. Oh, no, it's not the video. the video. Let me see if I can find it. Have I got it here? Where's, where's uh, James? It's James Corden's response. Let's see if I can find it. James Corden's response to fat shaming issue. This is a video from the claps back, supposedly, right? According to the Time magazine, which is, you know, preposterous to think he was clapped back at anyone. But this is basically uh, James Corden replying to it. It's a title from um, Time magazine. James Corden replies, oh, these auto videos, things on these websites are so annoying. Okay, cool. Pause it. So, um, James Corden cuts back at Bill Maher's insulting fat shaming comments. Um, so it's the following. Uh, James Corden took home uh, three Emmy Awards over the weekend, but he's currently in the spotlight for recent monologue that um, addressed a more serious issue of the carpool karaoke stars known for. On his late show, TV show, James Corden, that carpool karaoke thing as well, it's like such a bullshit show. I hate everything about it. Singing along in the cars of people. Like if I ever had a friend that wanted to do that carpool karaoke, I'd shove their head into the steering wheel, right? And take over. Like, no, we're not carpool or karaoke. We're adults, right? We don't sing in cars like that. Like, I know it. Unless it's fucking, unless it's a, a future album, I don't, I don't, I don't want to sing along to anything, right? Unless it's fucking, you know, um, Toxic Masculinity 101 album, I don't want to hear anything else in the car. Anyway, it continues. Um, he says, oh, fat shaming doesn't need to end. It needs to make a comeback. Bill Maher says, sorry, I, I, I apologize. Some amount of shame is good. We shame people out of smoking and into wearing seatbelts. We shame them out of littering. And most of the time, most of them out of racism. Shame is a first step to reform, which is true, right? There is, there is this idea that this is a strange way of cancel culture. There is cancel culture that essentially doesn't rehabilitate anybody. It essentially just says, you've done a bad thing. You're banned from society. Or you've done a bad thing you done a bad thing or a series of bad things, you can't have, you're not allowed to have these platforms to voice your opinion, right? It essentially just cancels you out of the conversation. Hence the cancel um, term. But what shame does is that shame exposes you and points everybody out to the deficiencies that you've done, calls you out on it, but also gives you a path to redemption and says, hey, this is bad and you're fucking up your life and this is not a good thing to do and we all disapprove of it. But if you do well and you kind of go back and rehabilitate yourself, we can be your, we can be your friends again, but if you don't do it, we can't be your friends. It's a very clear uh, platform, right? So it's essentially like Twitter saying, "Look, you have to show us that you're a better person when you come back, or you permanently would never have it." But it's not like completely deleting your account and completely erasing you. It's like we're gonna we're gonna take away your platform, but we're not gonna take away cons- like completely, so you don't have anything to say. We're gonna take away for a period of time, and you can come back later. So, so he's so he's here's James Corden's thoughts on it, right? He says it here. Fetch, uh, this is James Corden replying. Fat shaming never went anywhere, he responded. Ask literally any fat person. We're reminded of it all the time. There's a common and insulting misconception that fat people are stupid and lazy. And we're not. We know that being overweight isn't good for us. And I've struggled my entire life from trying to manage my weight. And I suck at it. I've had good days and bad months, which is fucking preposterous to say as a man. You've had good days and bad months losing weight. You know what it... This is the thing I think about losing weight. At being a for being a form of fat in myself. I was 265 pounds of my biggest, right? Which is what? Let me try and see if I can get up on here. Move my phone, actually. I'll see if I can find it. I was 265 pounds, right? 265 pounds. And now I'm like 220, all right? 220, 219 on a good day. I'm trying to get under 200 by the end of sober October. So um, please pray for me. Let me see if I can find it. Units measure. This call. Oh, sorry. Units plus this app I got on here. So wait. I used to be 260, right? 265. That's 18 stone, nearly 19 stone I was, right? And I'm comp- like six foot in, no, in without shoes, right? Straight up six foot, which is a lot. That's essentially morbidly obese from my height. And right now I'm 220, right? So that's, and I'm, so not t- 220, I'm 15 stone. So I was eight stone heavier than I am now, right? And my life was fucking hell. And yes, he's, he's right. Fat shaming is kind of still around in kind of an, uh, a silent way in that you know you always are reminded of how big you are I remember being on trains and never sitting down for instance when you're fat because you don't want people to make that adjustment when you're about to sit down that you're this massive big dude so i never sat down on a chair i think most people are aware when you go on a, on a train you will see a lot of, of mobile obese people standing up they tend to do that quite often um i was also aware how fat i was due to the escalators going down to a train station or going up a train station so if i was standing on one side of an escalator i'd notice whenever people would come by me they'd have to kind of go side on Right, so we walking up the stairs past everyone else. That's kind of a normal weight or an average weight. But the moment they pass a bigger person, because you you know you're wider than everybody else, or your bum's wide, they kind of have to make a side movement. It always made you feel. It made me feel awful. So sometimes I'll be standing on the escalators. I remember with my back to the with uh, back to the rail, just so I wouldn't feel like that. So I know what he's talking about. There are these 
but there are these um things that happen these kind of ninja insults right um all these micro insults that happen without people realizing that due to that remind you of how fat you are but by and large no one really shames you out of eating a burger like your parents do i remember my parents would do that to me all the time when i used to live at home and i was fat i don't know there'll be a time i wake up in the morning i wake up no i'll be it'd be like 11 o'clock at night and i'll be frying some chicken steak right or eating some burger or something my mom would be like you're eating that really at this time like really should you be eating that like she'd kind of you know that kind of mum shame right because you're you know she's concerned about your weight or about your health she doesn't want you to die essentially so that's a new kind of shame you'd get from your parents. But again, you don't listen to your parents. You're like, ah, oh, shut up, mum. You don't know what you're talking about. But outside, no one will really say nothing to you. You go to eat with your friends at lunch and you eat all the 17 starters. No one would say, hey, you know, you might want to lay off that if you're considering about your weight. And as well, like, I wasn't one of those people that told myself that I was on a diet. He's, he is. I mean, James Cole mentioned in the video. He's like, oh, I've done all the diets and never, nothing works. Like, we know, we, you, as a fatty, you know why you're a fatty. You're eating too late. You eat too much shit you don't exercise enough and that's it right or whatever like there is nothing else to kind of um hypothesize from it there are some people that do have genetic dispositions to gain you more weight but again you have to make the adjustments if you're so if you're a member if you imagine if you're an athlete and cardio doesn't come natural to you do you just not do cardio or do you train to have a level of cardiovascular or cardiovascular um endurance or so, to some respects so allows you to do the training you train, adjust to it so you can meet that threshold. But you don't completely abandon it because you just can't do it. You have to do something that either compensates for it or is a kind of an adjustment to it or is a replacement for it. But you do something. Like, so like in CrossFit, right? When you RX, right? A workout. You can do the main workout or you can do one that's adjusted to your kind of level of athletic ability. But you have to make some adjustment. Anyway, James Corner continues. He was saying, oh, we managed to in a follow-up interview with Entertainment Weekly. Called him further explaining his response. He says, he has nothing but respect for Ma. I saw something that I felt like I had experience with. Ultimately, I think I know a little bit more than what it's like to be overweight than perhaps some other people do. What? Well, because you're, it's as, as if that's a virtue to have in your, and this is something to be proud of, to have fly around like a flag or something oh yeah i'm overweight so I, I can speak for the overweight community like go and fuck yourself um there are some people also that are overweight that just don't care and want to be fat that's also cool but don't go on as if like being overweight is some sort of kind of victimhood thing that's just preposterous ultimately i think i know a little bit more uh, that perhaps some people did do so to see someone talk like that made me feel like well this is something i feel like we should talk about so if i call in response can you to garner warm response on videos and his comments this is not the first time but anyway so this is built uh, james corden being james corden and i guess again there's nothing wrong with it basically but i would prefer i don't like apologists or excuse makers i guess that's probably my thing with it and he just looks at somebody that has, you know, a lot of a whiny excuse meter with him. He's friends with celebrities just because he's like the fat, bubbly, happy dude. And then when somebody calls him out for being a fat, bubbly, happy, or someone calls out fat, bubbly, when somebody calls out fat people, he tends to then get personally attacked by it or, you know, catch his feelings and wants to defend it. It's like, isn't that part of your personality? Isn't that part of your claim to fame that you're the fat, bubbly, happy person? Why would you then get offended by it? Then just continue your life and keep it moving. But it's obvious that it shows that he's probably not happy with himself and not happy with his body and what he looks like. Lose some weight. Maybe there's a part of it that's like, you know, he's probably thinking, you know, if I lose the weight, I won't be as funny. I won't have this gig. Then probably it's not probably a good gig to have in it if you have to kind of hold on to your gig, hold on to your gig just because of your size. But again, I'm not a fan of him whatsoever. I think the show's corny. I think he's corny. I think the response is corny. But again, what do you expect, isn't it? Just cookie cutter television host people just you know are what they are and i'm sure in person he's probably a good guy but the response i wasn't a fan of again so if you want to check it out you can but it came out a while back ago um james corden and bill Maher going back to back or going uh tip for tat um i wouldn't say it was a clap back really i don't think he clapped back that well in that regard but you know people have their way of saying things anyway um you know what that might be the end of the show because it's an hour in and i have to head off to work so thank you again for tuning in it's the Excellence English Show, episode number 389. As always, if you're watching via YouTube, please click the thumbs up button. Um, give me a like. Give me a subscribe if you want to watch another video and be reminded of the videos I put out. Also, check out my clips channel, which I have in the link below for you to see. Not clip, well, clips playlist for you to see all my clips I upload onto the channel. Leave a comment if you have any questions, something you found funny, let me know. Um, if you're listening via the podcast app, obviously leave me a five star review. That'll go a long way to help people find the show. If you want to support the show and buy me a beer or help to fund new camera, new equipment, you can also click the Patreon link in the show notes to donate as little as $5 towards the development of this show. $5, what is that? It's like three pounds? Nothing, in it? Yeah. Um, and as always, 
see you on all the other social media platforms i'll be djing a couple of weeks too second of november at the heath cotton stars so keep an eye out for that you'll be able to find that in my show notes as well but until then my good friends it's been a pleasure it's been a very 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 fun time but i guess i'll see you again very very soon peace and take care bye